Okay, Marty. Okay, Mal. We are live on Facebook. Today Wonderful. we've got Mel with Marty Martin Herskovitz. Hi, Marty. Hi, Mel. Nice to be here. Nobody's going to believe that we didn't coordinate our shirts and our doors. <laughs> yeah, well, what can I tell you? Okay, I can tell the audience that we're here with a very rare, special, wonderful guy. But before we start, we have to have the jingle. And Marty, I know you love the jingle. I love the jingle. You pay it 10 times from my standpoint. <laughs> I'll dance. I'll dance and you can play it. Okay. Um, one second. I have to uh, go back for a second. I made all the wrong moves here. I got excited to see you. It's been a while. <laughs> Okay. Okay, you've got Mel. We're almost ready to go here. Almost ready to go. <laughs> you can sing along with it if you want. Get a chair, grab a seat, or we'll sweep you off your feet. We move, we groove, you got Mel. Ease your legs, rest a while, all you gotta do is smile. We're swell, can't you tell you got Mel? <laughs> when the show begins, you better hold on real tight. Or before you know it, you'll be high as a kite. Take a break, settle down, we're the only show in town. SRO, don't you know you got Mel? Give it up, don't think twice, we're a hurricane on ice. What the hell? Give it yell, ring your bell, show and tell. Mademoiselle, give a smell, you got Mel. You've got Mel. And Mel has. Get a chill, oh. a seat, or we'll see. Marty. <laughs> yes. I'm you still asked here. for it twice. Yeah, exactly. Great. So, 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 Marty, among other things, you are a poet and a philanthropist and a yes. mensch. And I want you to start before the beginning, uh, talk about your parents, uh, how you came to be and how you came to have this, um, I would say, uh, miraculous, say, uh, a, um, I don't know what to call it. Cool, okay, maybe. we'll give it a name afterwards. Let me start. I'll, I'll, okay. I'll shut up now. <laughs> okay. Um, a main part of my identity is that I'm second generation, a, a child of Holocaust survivors. Um, my parents were both born in 1924 in a little town near Munkac called uh, Seredna. And they're actually first cousins or whatever. In 1929, when my father was five years old, his uh, father and mother and, two, and the two siblings he had then um, moved to America. Uh, but the, they left behind uh, his, him and his brother because they heard that in America there weren't schools, there weren't yeshivot. It was a uh, very, not very religious uh, place. And so they said, okay, you'll stay here. So my uncle went to uh, my... Uh, to my, my uh, to his mother's mother's house to the Stearns, and my father went to my father's father house to the Herskovitzes Abraham Herskovitz, and they stayed there for about six years till 1935. And um, to me, I don't quite understand how you can leave a four and five year old behind, and I think it affected them both emotionally or whatever. But uh, okay. Uh, he came to America and like he was a 12 year old in, in the second grade because he didn't speak any English and he ha had to learn how to read. Or, uh, so he's with his littlest brother who had been born in the meantime. And then uh, every, every few months he would skip a grade and go up a grade and finally he graduated uh, uh, about on time. Um, now my mother, who's his first cousin, stayed in Seredna and um, they were under Hungarian occupation. And for, for a while they were the allies of the uh, Germans of the Nazis, but they won't um, co uh, collaborate as far as sending people to, to the gas chambers. And this got Hitler very upset. So in 1943, he overthrew the Hungarian government and put in a, uh, his own government, a puppet government, and in 1944, they started send, uh, setting up ghettos and started deporting um, people to, uh, to Auschwitz. So in uh, around Pesach 1944, 
my mother was taken to a, a ghetto, it was in Ungvar. They put it near the brook, brick factory because the brick factories are very, it's very heavy. They had to, they were very near the rail lines so they didn't have to transport it very far. So there was, there was this large brick factory with a large yard. So they took out all the bricks and they put the Jews from the surrounding villages in, in this uh, area and for about, they were there for about a month and then the uh, non-Jews started complaining that, that, that uh, the, there was a terrible smell and it was causing diseases and things like that. So the Hungarian uh, government then started deporting them to Auschwitz. So around Shavuot of 1944, <laughs> my, my mother was sent to Auschwitz. She was about 20 years old and um, she was there, uh, she was in Auschwitz for about three months, and then she got sent to a, a work camp near Frankfurt. There was an airfield there, and they had the a women uh, clear after the bombings of the, uh, of the Allied forces, of the Americans and the French and the British. Uh, uh, they would uh, have to clear out the, uh, fill in the, the holes and clear out all the debris that was there. And you know, sometimes they got bombed on. And um, so she was there for about five months. And then what happened was, is that since they were so near the French border, at the end of uh, 1944, the uh, Americans were getting near. So they were deported to Ravensbrück. And Ravensbrück, uh, they were there for a few months. And then they were put on a train because the, the, uh, German, uh, the, the Russians were getting near or it may have been the Americans, I don't know who, who uh, liberated Ravensbrück, they were put on a train and this train was ransomed by the Swedish Red Cross. And uh, the, the head of the Swedish Red Cross then, there was, Wallenberg was involved with them and also Count Bernadotte. Now, I don't know if you've heard of the name Count Bernadotte because he has to do with uh, is, uh, Israeli history also, because Count Bernadotte in 1940, Seven was uh, put in charge of trying to be, be, be uh, to to negotiate a peace treaty between the Arabs and the Israelis, and uh, the Lehi felt that he was much too lenient and much more on the side of the Arabs. So then a uh, person named Yitzhak Yezernitsky he uh, set up a cell in order to assassinate him. And so the, the person who saved my mother was ba basically killed by Israelis. Yitzhak Yezernetsky eventually changed his name to Shamir, and he was also the head of the, became the prime minister of the country or whatever. So um, this is, uh, so this is what happened is they were ransomed in, by the Swedes and they were taken to Sweden to rehabilitate themselves. This was in the spring of 1945. And um, they stayed there a little less than a year. 1940, uh, 1946, they had uh, been writing letters to their uncle, who was my grandfather, my father's father, to take them to, uh, to America, to bring them to America. In 1946, they were brought to America by my uncle. And uh, they were taken to the house and they were treated very badly. They were treated like, first of all, the, the children made fun of them that they didn't know Yiddish and that they, you know, that they allowed themselves to, to go to the concentration camps and they treated them, they were, were did domestic jobs since, the, you know, they were treated like maids. They ran away from there when my other uncle, where my, my mother's uncle eventually came to, to America and lived in New York. They ran away to there. But my father, who had, uh, was the only one who was very actually decent to, to, my, to, to the three of them. They were three of them together. Uh, my, uh, my mother, her sister, and, and their aunt were all about the same age, and they went through Auschwitz together. He was the only one who was nice probably because he knew what it was like to be an immigrant and to come and not know the language. And so in uh, 1946, the end of 1946, he went to New York and proposed to my mother and they got married. And uh, they got, uh, then, uh, you know, first my sister was born right away in 19, uh, beginning of 1948. My sister followed a couple years after and I uh, came a couple years after. And um, 
What's interesting about uh, the, the Holocaust uh, survivors is, is that they, it was very important to them to, to get married. A lot of times they would get married with, one second, I'm looking for a poem. All right. And they would get married right away with, with, with uh, you know, with, uh, without even paying attention. Sometimes, you know, someone from the same country or someone who was related. So it was quite common that they would get married right away. And they would um, also, uh, they would get married right away. A lot of the times, the, the, the whole idea of the second generation is that these people were not really 100% ready to be, uh, to, be, to, be, to be parents or whatever. They had just undergone a trauma. My father had been abandoned as a child. My mother was, you know, went through Auschwitz and was, was traumatized. And so it was very important to them, after all the destruction, to, to bring back the life and, and, and feel alive again. But on the other hand, they weren't uh, very, uh, very qualified to serve as parents. And Marty, I, Marty, one second, just a second. Your dad came to America a few years before the war? 1935, yeah. So he was, he was a refugee from before the war? Yeah, yeah, uh, whatever, because uh, his parents sent for him or whatever. Yeah. And okay. um, are you going to read us a poem now? Yeah, because, I, you know, I have a lot of anger about this sort of thing, because on one hand, I feel that they weren't, you know, they weren't able to be very good parents. But on the other hand, you can't really be angry at them because they went through so much, you know, and, and they suffered so much. So as a child, you can't say, well, you know, you can't can't be angry at them. So what I what I found was is, is that I would uh, I would use poetry to um, this was when I was around forty. I started expressing my my feelings during uh, during um, uh, by, by by writing poetry. This poem is uh, I was going to Jerusalem one one day uh, to to, vi to visit Amcha about some sort of poetry program I wanted to do with them and. It was uh, in, in, in February and it was a very cold day and it was an ice storm. And while I was going up on the way to Jerusalem, you have the, um, the almond trees. And the almond trees are the first ones to, to, uh, to bloom. Hashkediya porachat, we sing it to Bishvat. So around to Bishvat, they start blooming. And here you have this terrible storm and you have these pale white flowers being buffeted in, in, in an ice storm, and it just seems so cruel. The nature seems so cruel that that you put out these uh, these blossoms and and you expose. How could the tree do this to their to the blossoms that they expose them to the to 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 the the terrible conditions? And this I saw it as a metaphor for what I went through. So it's it's called renewal. In Jerusalem, the day after the snowstorm. The blossoming almond trees were blanketed with snow. I watched the branches swirl in the wind and the shower of petals that knew not to hold on. It is cruel to bloom in the winter, I thought, when one's sap is still turgid and sour, exposing translucent blossoms to the shivering rain and sleet. What fruits can be brought forth from these, thick husks and bitter, no doubt? And when stillness comes, of what do these blossoms dream? of late evening sunshine, fragrant red flowers, and hummingbirds craning their shimmering necks to drink from their nectar, perhaps. But theirs is to bloom while the hummingbirds sleep, impelled by some impassive force of nature, bent on renewal, to put forth these tiny pale flowers in the midst of a maelstrom. Beautiful. So Marty, um, you... Uh... At, at what age did you forgive your parents? What age did I forgive my parents? Um, I, uh, I, I, that's a difficult question because I don't think- I didn't I say it got, would be easy. I, I, I don't think I ever got truly angry at them about this. It, it's more of a sadness than, than an anger. I mean. There, there's an anger here, but uh, you know I can't. 
I can't really, uh, I can't, um, I don't know what to tell you about, about the, 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 the I, give me, happening. give me, an, you told me, you told me. I would imagine, I would imagine that, that by writing the poetry, I sort of dealt, dealt with, uh, with, with the anger. Okay. And that helped me deal with the anger. So I would say around 45, 50 or whatever. But I, if you're asking me, do I, does it, I, I feel a lot of, I feel that that a lot of my my problems are based in in my early childhood, and so I don't think there's still times when I get angry about it when I don't feel that 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 I'm I have enough self esteem. I say, well, this is because what whatever and whatever or whatever. So there's still anger there. You should have a lot of self esteem. But can you give an example from your childhood, uh, something that really bothered you that still bothers you? I don't remember my childhood. I've pretty much repressed all my childhood. I'll I, um, I'll give you an example of, of what what I felt or whatever, and I'll I'll read a poem. I mean, I went in 2003. I went to on a joint trip with the is uh, Israeli Arabs and and Jews to Auschwitz, uh, run by a uh, father Emil Shufani, and uh, they had a couple times of uh, a couple meetings of, of preparation. On one of the meetings, they brought Moshe Schneer, who's a historian from Lochamea Getot. And he told the story that uh, that one time while he was in the, um, in, in the uh, memorial service and in Lochamea Getot, he suddenly, you know, he wasn't paying attention. He was uh, like a kid, your, your mind is, is wandering, you know, it doesn't really interest you. He, suddenly someone called his name. They called the name from on the Bama. And, he, you know, and he says, you know, from the stage, and he says, what, what, what's going on? And then he realized what they read was his grandfather's name, who was named after him, you know. And then, you know, when you realize that, you know, I have two names and I'm named after, you know, my my. my mother's uh, father and also my uh, father's gr grandfather, but he lived with him for, for many years. So he felt very close to him. So you realize that, you know, your life is not always your own. And so I'd like to read you a story. It's called uh, Berries. It's based on that, the story of Moshe Schneer. Berries. I remember the ceremony as a child and the lengthening shade of the mulberry tree as the kibbutz elder read their names, their names, names that were now ours. Names like the breeze that wafted upwards through the tendrilled green mulberries. Names like the shadow that grew long with day's end. Late that summer, I would return to the tree to put, pick these mulberries from the ground, their sweetness bittered with dust, unaware of the names that had lodged in my soul like the tiny hard seeds of a mulberry. So, you know, that's, that's the sort of thing where you you have a, a, an expectation. I mean, your parents are not happy. I mean, they're traumatized. And as a child, you try to make them happy, but you realize that it's, you know, you feel you take it on yourself and you feel that it's your fault. But, you know, as you grow older, you realize that it's not really your fault. It's, it's the fault, you know, of um, that, that, of the trauma. But as a child, you don't know that, you know, and you see, you try to, to fill their expectations and you never can. And, and it reminded me of the story in the Bible about Joseph and Pharaoh's dream, where, the, where there were these skinny cows and they ate these gigantic fat cows, but then they were still skinny and, and famished, you know, so that's how I felt. So this is my story of, of the expectations. Pharaoh's cows. I am part of a war unfinished, a war that will not be finished. It's dead, unburied, unmourned. I am part of lives concealed, a syllable in a secret unwhispered, sealed in a chamber of pain. I am part of a chasm of need, its hungers unsated, like the cow in Pharaoh's dream, devouring fatted heifers, gaunt with dissatisfaction. So, you know, so that, that, that gave me goosebumps. Uh, we, my, all, my, we, all Marty, deal, we all have to deal with parental dissatisfaction. I don't think there's a child who actually lives up to the dis, uh, to the expectations of their parents. But I felt exactly. 
I felt it very, very uh, acutely that 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 I was a disappointment. Okay, but you're 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 not a, you're a joy to me. Um, and you just you just recited from my bar mitzvah, you know, by him kids. Uh, Oh, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, incredible. But, but you grew up and, and you, uh, you, you you got an education and you came to Israel and you raised a family. A few details on that, please. Yeah, okay. So I want to talk about one another aspect of, of poetry, and we'll get into it later perhaps, is, is that uh, there were two aspects that I used poetry for. One was dealing with a, a lot of the pain and, you know, to, to express my dissatisfac dissatisfac dissatisfaction of how I was raised and how, you know, how difficult it is being a second generation, which, uh, which was a catharsis for me. The other thing is, is that my parents never spoke about the Holocaust. And, you know, they never mourned anyone who was involved in the, in, in the war. I didn't know anything about, you know, my relatives, my uncles and my grandparents and anything like that. They said the past isn't, the past isn't important. It's, you know, it, uh, only the future, only the present and the future and plan for the future. And, um, you know, that's what uh, I, I for, a, for a long time, I believed that. But then I realized that that I needed roots, and and the um, I used I used poetry in order to create roots and 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 to have the feeling of a family and to mourn. And that's I will we'll speak about that later when we talk about what um, what, what I'm doing now and creating memory. But uh, so let's talk about Aliyah. So I made Aliyah in 1986 with my wife and uh, two kids, we've added a uh, Sabra since then. And um, uh, we lived in Petah Tikva for a while, and then, uh, then we, in, uh, in, uh, two, in the year 2000 and, uh, 2004, we moved to Rehovot. In 2001, my son has uh, ADD, uh, as, uh, attention deficit disorder, and we were in Petah Tikva, and there was a special school in the Shomron in uh, Kedumim, called Menei Chayel, which was meant for uh, children with uh, learning disabilities and attention deficit disorder. So we sent them, we sent them to that, that school. And uh, this was about in uh, year 2000. Year 2001, the second intifada started. And um, because uh, there, there was, they couldn't go over the green line without accepting special transportation. They were taken to the near the to a gas station near the Calculia crossing, and uh, from there a, a different uh, transportation, which was um, which was bulletproof uh, protected, uh, would, would pick them up. What happened was that that day the the um, the second bus to, that had the protection was a little bit late. So they sat down, they ate some sandwiches for breakfast and things like that. This was in March uh, 28, 2001. A uh, suicide bomber crossed over from the area near the gas station and he blew himself up. Uh, two, two high school students were uh, killed and my son who was wearing uh, sunglasses or whatever, it, it, it imploded and the, the gas, the glass slivers entered his eye and tore up his retina and um, lost sight in one eye. And um, so a, a few years later, uh, there, the, the, some lawyers came to me and said, look, we want to try to bring a case since he's an American citizen, you know, against the Arab bank who was funding the, the Hamas and, and the terrorists, uh, maybe, you know, at, at, at least they will know that they can't get away scot-free, that they'll have to pay the legal fees. And I said, oh, no, no problem. You know, I didn't expect anything from it because, you know, a lot of there's a, these cases usually don't go anywhere. Well, it happened to be that this case in 2012 or whatever, they found for the, for the 74 families that were on the case, and uh, um, the Arab Bank was supposed to go to um, to uh, a, the uh, 
punitive uh, trial. Now, there's a difference between a, 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 a to find guilt, uh, innocence and guilt, you're very limited as far as the proofs you can bring, but in a punitive trial, you can be, you know, there's, it's no hold barred. And so the bank really was afraid of all the bad um, publicity. So they said, look, we're going to uh, be appealing it, but we don't want to go to punitive trial and we're willing to have a small settlement for, uh, for the families or a relatively large, so, you know, a significant settlement so that we don't have to go to punitive uh, trial. And uh, so uh, in 2016, I, I, uh, my son got some money and we got some money. Since it wasn't money that I really wanted or needed, um, and I really didn't expect it. I felt that it was coming from like the heavens. It wasn't, you know, really mine or whatever. I said, I'm going to make up a uh, family fund, a, a donor uh, advised fund. And I've been slowly giving away the, the money that, uh, not so slowly, it's going quicker than I expected, but I've been giving away the money for, for the, you know, to, for Jewish education and for Holocaust remembrance for uh, Aliyah, Aliyah is important to me. I think that, that you know, I think that we're two examples of how Olim who come here can significantly impact the, 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 the society here. And I think it's very important. I think we're a very quality um, uh, population that we should try and, and have more Americans. I would think that, that if we would have more Americans who who who, who are brought up on on on, uh, on on values that that of democracy and of liberty and 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 uh, etc. I think that that a lot of the problems we have, you know, would be would be lessened. I really feel that 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 we bring we can bring a lot. We bring first of all our talents. You know, you as a musician or whatever, I mean, not just joking. <laughs> no, you, you've done so much for this. You're a professor and, uh, you know, you've taught. Right, the show is about you, my dear. Oh, the show is not about you? I just want to give you a little uh, okay. saying that I'm very happy that you're in Israel. It's so happy. I, it makes me happy to see people like you in Israel. But, you. Um, you know, I, I so I, I give to Ali, I give to Nefesh Benefesh. And the one thing that I do is, is, is the idea of, of Holocaust remembrance. I really feel that I'm not happy with the way the Holocaust was remembered. I mean, when you talk about Holocaust, you're talking about all these horrors and you, all these terrible you know, movies and clips and pictures, and no one wants to watch it. And I mean, it's not something that, that, that the youth wants to deal with or whatever. And I feel that, that the, there needs to be like I learned to mourn, I think that we need, like like we do for the soldiers, you know, we need to mourn. These are pe Jewish people who, who we lost and, and they're our families and we should mourn. And I don't feel that the day uh, has enough, uh, is, is, is about mourning enough. And so I would like to, to I will, I, I, just as I uh, was able to mourn, via the uh, the use of poetry and uh, to say, okay, you know, I there's a silence here, no one talks about it, but I'm able to create the emotional con content for these, via the poetry. I think the future generations also through the creativity and, and, and through the, by looking for themes that are common to them and, and to the Holocaust, and creating on the uh, on these themes, we we can connect them. So let's say uh, the idea the idea of of parting, you know, of, of farewells, of uh, uh, or the idea of family, the idea of survival, the idea of identity. These are themes that are in the Holocaust, but they're also common to to the youth today. And if we you know we bring them, we we talk about these themes, and we bring uh, their literary poems and things like that about them. And then we say, okay, you create about this theme in the, in the context of the Holocaust. And, and that's how we, um, we are able to, there comes out uh, beautiful creations that I think really connect them to the Holocaust remembrance. Okay. Um, so but before you read us a poem, uh, yeah. your, son, your son is fine? 
my son is fine. Is fine. I mean, he he also he has he he's he, he's he's been diagnosed. He first of all he doesn't see from the eye. Um, he also has uh, post traumatic uh, syndrome or whatever. He's not, you know, he, he has problems with that or whatever. But he, I mean, he has he's married. He has children. He works. So you know, we we thank God for that or whatever. And um, so, so uh, when I, when when you met my students, yeah, last year, the students they couldn't believe that a person like you exists. They said, "Okay, um, how, how do you uh, when you give away the money, what do you get?" <laughs> it was like, how could there be people who just give away money? Um, do you realize that you're like one of the very few people? uh who um who do this kind of thing do you, you realize that um i don't understand it. i don't understand why i'm not i'm one one of few people who do it i know there are people who i i see people who have millions of dollars or whatever how much do you really need or whatever that's, I a, need different, that's a different question i know a lot of millionaires who are not philanthropists yeah and i don't know whether you, you're a millionaire but you you literally give away money for causes that you believe in. Yeah. I think that uh, money has no importance. I think what we do in life is, is more important. And I think that, you know, tikkun olam and trying to make this uh, Israel a better place because I, I give main, uh, only in Israel or whatever. And it's important to me. And, and it, I'm, I'm very much in pain about what, what's happening in Israel now. From all this, from all the standpoints of people who are suffering and and you know the uh, the, the the divides that are happening within the people, it, it's very painful for me. This whole thing, and I don't see how a person in society can, can say, "Okay, I'm I'm worried about myself and I'm not worried about the other or whatever." I just, you know, it it may be that that because of the you know the, the Holocaust and also the way I was brought up. That that you know I I didn't I didn't you know I was always worried about my parents and not worried about myself and things like that. That I really didn't you know I I don't take care of myself enough. And maybe you know there are people who are saying well you know you could buy you look at my car and it's dented and it's all and things like that. I don't need it. I don't need a different car. I'm perfectly happy with it. I don't understand how people can put, you know, uh, $300,000 uh, down on a car or whatever. And, 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 and your wife is okay with it. She says, okay, Marty, we'll give all the money away. Well, yeah, well uh, you know, this, well, you, every pot finds its cover. <laughs> no, I, I, I literally think that you're remarkable. What, what, uh, what mistake do people make uh, when they write to you, or what is the biggest misconception about philanthropy? <laughs> um, first of all, I don't get that many people who, who come who who come to me. I mean, basically, I'm I'm a very small fund. I'm not located. I do I do very I don't do any um, uh, PR. I don't have my name uh, flaunted on, on any sort of, uh, I mean, here or there, you might be able to catch, catch a glimpse of me, but I, I want to choose who I go to and where I go to. And I, I pretty much um, initiate all, all, all my, all my uh, philanthropy or whatever. So no one really comes you're to way, me. You're way up there on the Rambam's list there. Um, so uh, now is a good time to read a, uh, a poem. Okay, so um, this is also uh, uh, this is a poem I uh, wrote also in, in regards to the trip that we made to uh, Poland for with uh, the Israeli Arabs and, and Jews. Um, so they told us before the trip, you know, it was very uh, it was choreographed the whole visit, and they said. Okay, we're going to start by the uh, by the the main train station, and it's about a kilometer away from Birkenau. 
because there the, the the main train area served both Auschwitz and Birkenau and Auschwitz III, so it was uh, pretty much in the middle. And so they said we're going to walk from the main uh, from the main area to uh, to uh, Birkenau, and it has to be in silence. And for me. You know, I said, you know, I said silence, you know, my whole life has been silence, you know, when I'm coming to Auschwitz to, to, to find words or whatever. So yeah. this is, this is, uh, you know, and everyone says about the, the Holocaust, you know, that, that, that there are no words or whatever, you know, and so, and my whole job as a poet was trying to find the narrative and find the words. So it's called ineffable. In the face of the ineffable, there can be no words, they say, only silence. But my life has been measured by decades of silence, not mere kilometers. So the crunch of the flagstones, the swirl of the winds, even the tears are no stead. In Auschwitz, silence will not suffice. For when words return, they return as they were, like seeds scattered on frozen ground. But if I find the language of desolation to parse therewith a syntax of the pain, then words entombed may shall resurge and flow. Words who tears may hear, heal the soul again. I think that that's, that's part of the job is in also now is to find the words. I mean, we're, we're in a crisis now. And a lot of the times we're just shouting slogans and what we really need to find are, are the words, you know, the words that, 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 that speak our pain and speak of our hope and speak of our resilience or whatever. And we don't hear those words so much. We hear the words of accusations. We hear the words of, of people yelling, you know, you're wrong there, you're wrong, it's your fault, it's your fault, you're not doing a good enough job or whatever. Instead, instead of finding, first of all, the words of pain, the, finding the words of resilience and finding the words of hope. And so that's what we really have to do is this is what I did here is whatever. And I mean, I looked for the, for the words that will, that will help me deal with, with, with my past and try to make me feel that it's something that I can resolve and deal with or whatever, because, you know, sometimes when it's, when, you know, it, it's, it's, un, it's left unspoken, you really can't deal with it psychologically. You have to, you know, bring it up and bring it out and, 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 let it see the, the light of day. And I think that's what a lot of what we have to do now with COVID. So if we're, gonna, if we're talking about COVID and we never talk about it on the show, but I'll make an exception. Um, maybe we should start something where, where young people write uh, poems of remembrance for all of the, for all of the victims. Of this that would be amazing. Okay. I think that's an, an amazing idea because we have all, all, you know, basically you have numbers and we, we and occasionally they'll, they'll put an article about the person, but what we really need is, is, is some sort of remembrance and to mourn them. And I don't think that we really mourn them. I mean, we're saying, oh, well, you know, it, it happens and things like that. And, you know, uh, you know you, you, it's a number. You say, okay, another 16 dead. And you say, oh, good, it's, not, it's a 16 and not 30. But each of those 16, as a person, you know, and we don't really know them. And it would be great if someone, you know, would get together somehow that that family and things like that would, would write poetry about them and, 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 and keynote about the situation. Because I think a lot of the, you don't really feel that we're mourning. I don't think we as a society, we're mourning. I think we're, we're in a lot of repression about as far as that feeling is. And we really don't feel, okay, people have died. Yeah, I think it's a wonderful idea. Yeah, okay, but what I'm going to say is that uh, you're going to take care of it, and I'll publish the poems. <laughs> <laughs> you you have the framework to. I'll help you, but uh, this is yeah. uh, you know this is in your domain. <laughs> uh, what, I, I, Marty, what what haven't I asked you? What? No, you have to. What what do you want to ask me? Is there anything else, or you're happy with what's going on so far? No, I mean, so, so you look back now on your life. Uh, you um, you made the major changes. Yeah. Uh, you grew up and moved to Israel. 
Um, you raised a family here. Uh, you had a, uh, a trauma in your own family. Um, and um, and how, how do you look back on everything now? Are you a happy camper? It's taking you um, after that. First of all, I'm, I'm, I, I was happy uh, uh, before the COVID because uh, by uh, creating memory was go going really well. Yeah. And I'm hoping that it'll start up again or whatever. And I think that that it's a wonderful way. I saw how it affected and that that people re realize that that use by emotional connection to the Holocaust, you're basically you can deal with the memory, you can deal with the trauma and, and it speaks to the youth. And I was you know, you we're talking about a, a, a future where there won't be survivors to talk and, you know, they're they're wondering what will be. And I think that uh, that creativity is the answer. And yeah. how, how it connects with someone. So and it was going really well. We're in a situation now. Yeah. You know, where we have a, a plague, a magifa. Yeah. And um, and what you're saying is because of Sinat uh, Chinam and because we're all at each other's throats, you know, it's your fault, it's your fault. Um, and, and maybe we need some of your. Uh, your Marty love, you're, you're, you're getting young people to write poems, your um, your tikkun olam. Yeah, that would be great. I don't know how to do it because like we, we the, can, schools, we'll talk, the schools, we'll the schools, the, the uh, educational institutions are not, they, they can't deal with it. They're, they're overwhelmed by just dealing with you know, dealing with with the situ with the situation, trying to get to, to teach them long division and how to read and you know grammar and getting them ready for the bagruyot and it, it's a problem. As you know, you know, teaching by Zoom, that's it's a whole new animal, and they really don't know how to do it, and they're just they're learning on the fly. And it seems that you know, uh, you you said that that you know, a lot of these teachers. Don't have the skills they need to, to teach by Zoom, and and they're learning. They're learning. They're learning, and and to come to them and say, I have a great idea for something new. I said, we have enough new in our lives. We don't know need another thing new. So uh, I mean, I'm waiting for some sort of shigra, some sort of you know where 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 the craziness that is COVID becomes some sort of normalcy, and they're willing to uh, listen to someone, a new voice and a new idea, and you know, okay, we've wow. We've gotten, we've de dealt with this problem. We'll be able to deal with the next problem. A routine of Mishigas. It is. It is. Yeah. So, so Marty, I'm I'm uh, throwing the ball up in the air for you, and we can talk about it. Uh, you're a poet. My wife is a poet. Uh, <laughs> we should be getting a uh, young people in Israel and around the world to be writing poems of remembrance, and. Yeah. Um, for what's happening now, yeah, uh, because there's another lesson of the uh, of the Holocaust um, that, and that is the lesson of the now. In other words, you're looking back at the memories after so many years, but there was a now. Mm -hmm. There was a time when things might have been done otherwise. Well, I think that, that we can, um, I think that uh, there, there, there was a wonderful resilience. I think the, the post-Holocaust uh, uh, period shows how resilient uh, humans can be and that how my parents and a whole generation raised a, a pretty amazing gener second generation with all our problems. You know, I think, you know, we've done some good and I think that you know, the third generation has, you know, is less screwed up than we are. And I think that uh, it's, I think that, that there's a certain amount of resilience that you could find uh, deep within if you, if, if you, you know, dig deep or whatever. And I think that the idea of creativity and, and emotional, uh, to, to, to deal with it emotionally and, and I'll allow the emotion to come to the fore is something that we're not doing or whatever. We're dealing with it very much on the surface and we're not looking deep inside of us to find the love and find the resilience and find the, the hope. 
because the, the, there is hope or whatever. And I think it's important that we learn from the Holocaust and the mistakes that were made with, with my parents' generation as far as, uh, you know, the, uh, how to c come, out of a, come out of a crisis or whatever in order that we don't make the same mistakes that, okay. that were made by parents. So Marty, uh, I salute you for that. And, uh, and we have a new project. So if anybody's watching us, on you've got Mel here with the philanthropist and poet, Marty, Marty here's the, it's, this is a good time to send us an email or a uh, message. Uh, and uh, maybe we can get the young people from all over the world to write the poetry about uh, the people that we've lost and- uh, or, or, or about their own, uh, their own crises and, yeah. and to deal yeah. with, you know, to say, okay, I'm in pain and, uh, you know, I'm going to, you know, and, and, and by even talking about the pain, you, uh, whatever, you can, uh, you know, you can find the blessing afterwards, and they're blessings also. So, um, so we have a project, Marty. Uh, we have a few projects. Okay, yeah. so um, I want you, a, we're, we're towards the end of the show. Before I ask yeah. you about the Beatles, I want you to read a poem. And you know, you know that I'm going to ask you about the Beatles. I don't, I'm not a big Beatles fan. You prefer the Rolling Stones? Uh, uh, Leonard Cohen, Simon and Garfunkel, yeah. Okay, Leonard Cohen, Simon and Garfunkel, I'm a big fan. Pick you a song. Are? are you kidding? I met Leonard Cohen, man. Oh, uh, you did? When did you meet Leonard Cohen? In 19, in the early, mid 80s. Uh, what's my favorite one? I think I like the. Uh, the Blue Raincoat song I like. Oh, my favorite. It is your favorite? Yeah. Oh, my, wow. my favorite, my wife's favorite. And it's, you should know that a lot of people, when you ask them, they will actually say that that poem. Yeah. <laughs> it's a poem. Okay, can yeah. you hum a few bars for us? It's four in the morning. The fourth of December, I'm here and <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Next time you're on the show, I want you to know it off by heart. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, and, and, and uh, listen, this has been uh, incredible. Uh, Marty Herskovitz, a poet, philanthropist, but basically a mensch, a person. Okay, can, I, can, I, can I read a last poem? Yeah, but I just want to say that I, I just, you know, you're remarkable. I, um, I'm not sure we've actually met because we met during the, we met during the, the mess. Yeah. I'm not sure we've actually met. I feel like, you know, I've sat I, there. We, I don't know. I don't remember. I don't think we've met. But anyway, oh, really? um, a, I just wish you happiness and naches and all good yeah, things. Thanks. Uh, you are a truly remarkable soul. And for Thank your you. last poem. Yeah, this is a... Uh, a so, uh, so this poem was, uh, you know, there's there's a poem by Zelda called the Holy Shishem, mm -hmm. you know, and on um, um, the Holocaust Remembrance Day, you they read off names, you know, but but the problem is is that you have just one name, and part of living is is you you gain all different names. You know, I'm sure that you can think back to your childhood, all the nicknames and what your parents called you and then what your friends called you and all sorts of silly names that, that, that you got. So I, this is about, uh, this, is, this is about names, names. My mother's father was named Mordechai Kleinbart, but maybe because he was the eldest son, his mother called him Tatele and his father, probably called him Mordechai, like my father calls me. His sister and brothers called him perhaps Boti, except for the baby sister who called him Momo, even after she grew up. His wife's cousins at the winery may have called him Kleine, and his children surely called him Patti, as did his wife, except late at night, alone in the bedroom, she would maybe call to him with Yiddish familiars and a soft erotic lilt, or maybe not, 
because Mordechai Kleinbart is the single name I have. So it is the one printed on paper, laminated in plastic, and it alone is carved into stone and molded in bronze. All other names exist in memories long interred or on pages yet unwritten. Incredible. Incredible. Yeah. The Zikro so, of Mordechai Kleinbert and to all the dozens of family who died in the Holocaust and who, who, who were never really mourned the way they should have been. Absolutely. But you know, Marty, the world needs you now. So uh, I'm going to phone you tomorrow. If you phone me, uh, okay, well, give me a call. I'm always happy to hear you. And, uh, and we'll see whether we, uh, we can draw up any, uh, any support for this, uh, this uh, project. So Great. Marty Herzlovitz, thank you so much for being on You've Got Mel. Uh, thank you for and, giving uh, me a forum to say by uh, what I have to say. Listen, when I meet somebody like you, I'm dying for you to be on. Um, okay. You can be on anytime. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, have a yep. great year. Keep on doing uh, wonderful things. Thank and, you. Uh, if there's more people like you, uh, I want to have them on my show. I'm not okay. sure there are, but just think, just <laughs> you just have to find them. Take care, my good friend. Bye. See you. Bye bye. Thank you.